I'm going to bring up Julian Adjaman, a professor of urban and environmental policy and planning at Tufts University. He is the originator of the concept of just sustainabilities, the full integration of social justice and sustainability, defined as the need to ensure a better quality of life for all, now and into the future, in a just and equitable manner whilst living within the limits of supporting ecosystems. The author and editor of 11 books and a wide range of other influential publications, his key books include Just Sustainabilities, Development in an Unequal World, Sustainable Communities and the Challenge of Environmental Justice, Cultivating Food Justice, Race, Class and Sustainability, Introducing Just Sustainabilities, Policy Planning and Practice, Incomplete Streets, Processes, Practices and Possibilities, and Sharing Cities, A Case for Truly Smart and Sustainable Cities. That's a book I have on my bookshelf right now, ready to get, dig, dig into. His latest book is Food Trucks, Cultural Identity and Social Justice, From Loncheras to Lobster Love. His next book, Immigration, Immigrants, Agriculture, and Food in North America is under contract with MIT Press, so keep an eye out for that. Julian is a critical urban planning and environmental social science scholar who thrives at the borders and intersections of a wide range of knowledges and methodologies, and he utilizes these in creative and original ways. His current research explores aspects of the complex relations between humans and the environment, whether mediated by institutions or social movement organizations, and the effects of this on public policy and planning processes and outcomes, particularly in relation to justice and equity. He's co-founder and editor-in-chief of the International Journal, Local Environment, the International Journal of Justice and Sustainability. Everybody, let us welcome Julian. Hi, thank you. Uh, do the people at the back want to sit down? People standing, do you want to sit down? Thanks, thanks, thanks. So usually what I do is kind of opening keynotes, but this is a, quite a challenge for me to do a closing keynote. Um, I've had to think a lot about it because the kind of ideas that I like to talk about are ideas that I think inform rather than close a conference. But having said that, what I want to do, rather than try and pick up on all the threads that I saw, and obviously there's a lot that I didn't see, rather than do that, what I want to do is use an academic's eye to give you some concepts that I think will provide a glue to all of the great work that is going on. So, in a sense, uh, and I'm what might be called a practical academic or pracademic, um, <laughs> It's a great one, that, isn't it? A pracademic. So what I want to do then is try and give you a whole bunch of concepts over the next 40 minutes or so that I think really provide a glue, provide some framework to all the great work you're doing. One thing uh, Briante did uh, forget to mention is I'm a board member of Eco Districts as well. And the reason why I'm a board member of Eco Districts is this organization is real. We are living the, uh, the words that we, we talk and the projects that you've been visiting are grappling with sustainability and justice issues. Now, the, the psychologists tell me that if I leave this slide up here for 45 seconds, 20% of you will be uh, on Amazon within about a minute buying the book. So I just got to make sure I get, the, uh, I get it right. That's what the psychologists tell me. Um, the only other important thing I want to mention is Twitter. Uh, my handle is at Julian Adjaman. Hashtag just sustainability is all one word if you're interested, if I say anything that is of, of great interest to you. So I'm going to try then to talk about how we can reimagine cities using this concept of mine of just sustainabilities, the integration of social justice and sustainability. But the first thing that I want to do, and I've been doing this now for a year since spending time in Canada and Australia, is every conference that I speak at, I recognize the uh, land, the colonized land, the stolen land on which we are meeting. And this land is the land of, uh, I believe, the Dakota Sioux. And I'd like to pay my respects and I'd like us to pay our respects to their elders, their past, their present and their futures and commit to participating uh, in a, a respectful and caring 
uh, meeting uh, for the rest of the time that we're here. And what I'd also like to do is just play a short piece from a Canadian um, Indigenous group, the Indigenous Placemaking Council, made in Canada, but I think it says some things, very key things that I want to develop as I uh, develop my talk. look like if nothing of your culture, history, language or art is visible in the streets, parks, buildings where you live, how can you ever feel welcome there? The Indigenous Placemaking Council seeks to restore Indigenous presence to Canadian cities, towns and communities. So I want you to remember that word belonging because a lot of what I'm going to be saying is about this concept of belonging. Uh, I think I'm going to unpack it and help you think about it uh, in, in a, I think, a special way. Let me just give you a little bit of background though about Just Sustainabilities and it's about 15 years now since we uh, wrote the book Just Sustainabilities Development in an Unequal World. This is my colleague uh, Professor Bob Bullard, many of you will know of him as the father of environmental justice and a colleague of mine in the UK Bob Evans. And really in the book what we did was embark on the first book that looked at social justice as the interplay between environment, equity and justice. There were plenty of books where sustainability was about environmental policy and the word equity cro cropped up once or twice. This book was about the intersection of those issues. And it was about the links, ultimately, between environmental quality and human equality. I would actually argue, I'll go as far as to say, that we've failed at both environmental quality and human equality because we've treated them separately. That's why we've failed. Environmental equality was about the green groups. Uh, human equality was about the, um, the social justice groups, Amnesty International, etc. These groups weren't talking together. Why weren't they? And that was something that we really were looking at in the book. And we argued that sustainability isn't just about green issues or environmental issues, important though they are. We said a truly sustainable society is one where questions of social need and welfare, economic opportunity and, uh, uh, sorry, economic opportunity are integrally related to environmental limits imposed by, by ecosystems. So it was really a way of trying to see social welfare and social justice as related to environmental and economic opportunity. But really, it wasn't until 2009, and this book came out, The Spirit Level. Now, I don't usually advertise other people's books. Uh, don't get me wrong here, but you must read this book. It is very readable. It is based on 40 years of data from around the world. And the headline is basically, countries with a bigger gap between rich and poor have more social problems, social deviancy, whether it's teen pregnancies, drug abuse, domestic violence, uh, incarcerations, you name it, it increases with increasing uh, gap between rich and poor. Countries with a lower gap between rich and poor do not have as many of these problems. The other thing that was very interesting as well about the research is countries with the biggest gap between rich and poor had higher advertising revenues. Advertisers love inequality. Inequality is good 
for sales because people in the lowest group want to get into the next group, the next group, the next group, the next group. The super rich want to get into the, I'm, you know, I want to get into the, the, the sort of super duper duper rich. So there is this escalator of consumption. So this idea then, inequality heightens competitive consumption. Now, if inequality heightens competitive consumption, what does it also do? It increases our carbon footprint. You heard it here. Inequality increases our carbon footprint. Now, we've got Bill McKibben coming to Tufts in uh, about three weeks' time, and I'm the moderator. And I'm going to confront Bill with this, because all I hear from the climate people is... We need to tackle transportation. We need to tackle this, that. We, have, we need sustainable agriculture. Yes, we do. But we need to tackle inequality as well. Inequality is bad for climate change. So if we really want to understand sustainability, I would say our focus should be on both human equality and environmental quality together. And I don't think anybody in this room would doubt that. In terms of what sustain just sustainability is, there are four conditions. It's about improving our quality of life and well-being. This fits in, a lot of this fits in, obviously, with the protocol. Meeting the needs of both present and future generations. A lot of sustainability formulations talk about future generations. We want social justice now, not in the future. We want it in the future as well, but we want to start right now. We need to look at just sustainability in terms of justice and equity as recognition process, procedure and outcome. This concept of recognition is really important and it's often left out. People talk about distributional issues, procedural justice, recognition, Black Lives Matter, Me Too. If we don't recognise the right to justice of certain groups, then we are not doing justice by them. And then the, the final, but not the most, uh, I mean, these, these four conditions are all equally important. The final one is living within ecosystem limits, one planet living. Now, let me, before I give you some examples of just sustainability, let me give you two overarching thoughts that I've been having on urban planning. One is related to a, a quote that I always use with my students by Patsy Healy, who's an emeritus professor. She says, Urban planning is managing our coexistence in, in, in shared space. What a fabulous way to think about what we do. This is what we're doing. Everything that I've heard is about managing our coexistence, celebrating our coexistence in shared space. So remember those two words, coexistence and shared space. Uh, Leonis Sandercock, a professor at University of British Columbia, she goes further and she says this quote, speaks with equal clarity about environmental transport, housing, and other conflicts, reminding us that whether we like it or not, we do share space on this planet with others who in many ways are not like us, and we need to find ways of coexisting in these spaces from the next door neighbour to the street, neighbourhood, city, and region. It would be easy to plan if everybody ate like us, looked like us, prayed like us, made love like us, did everything, you know, in the normal way. But we live in increasing cities of difference. That's a real challenge for planning. There is no public interest, there are multiple publics. How do we plan in the multiple public interest? Second point I want you to think about is coming to this notion, what's the relationship between belonging and becoming? And here's really something that has been kind of both troubling me, but it's going to be the title of probably of my next book. It's about the paradox between belonging and becoming. We're all about becoming, what our cities can become, sustainable, resilient, sharing. We're all about that, healthy. What about belonging? What about belonging? Are we as good at recognizing the need for belonging, recognition, reconciliation, difference, diversity, and inclusion, as we are at recognizing the need to develop what our cities can become. So we're better than most. I've got to say, the reason I'm involved with Eco Districts is we at least begin, are beginning to talk about these things, balancing belonging and becoming. But still, too much sustainability practice, smart city practice, is about what can our cities become? They can become smart, wired, all of this. And the forgotten are the issues of 
belonging. And I really want to put it here that just sustainability or hum what I call humane scaled as opposed to human scaled planning helps us think through both of these together, helps us think about coexistence and shared space and the relationship between belonging and becoming. When you go away, think about this relationship between belonging and becoming. Is what percentage of your work is about becoming and what percentage is about belonging? Think about that, because I think it should be more or less 50-50. Is it really about that? So I want to give you three examples of just sustainabilities in practice. One is this concept called spatial justice. How do we allocate rights to space? See, this is where the academic comes in. I mean, you've all been talking about this, but you talk about parks and you talk about spaces. But I think about how do we allocate rights to those spaces? How do we allocate rights to spaces and places in urban areas? And then I'm going to talk a little bit about culture, difference, and diversity. How do we recognize, understand, and engage difference, diversity, and cultural heterogeneity in creative, productive, and inclusive ways? I should put in brackets after that, in the age of Trump, because it, it, it is a very, you know, this is the antithesis of what the present administration is about. And then thirdly, I'm going to talk a little bit about sharing cities. Uh, how do we see the whole city as a shared space and reinvent the urban commons? And uh, one of the presentations this morning was from Shareable, Tom Llewellyn, who's in the audience. This focus on the urban commons, I think, is very, very important for us. It's a place really where our, uh, our ilk uh, should be. So let's talk about spatial justice first. Um, Many of our cities, many cities around the world, are actually divided physically. Many cities are divided physically, but some cities are actually divided by other means. Hands up who grew up in a town or city where there was a railway line, a creek, or some other landscape feature, and on one side they lived, and on the other side you lived. Who? Hands up. Okay, that's a good, a good third uh, of us. This is called spatial injustice. And a British MP, David Lammy, says, just as social justice requires that life chances are not distributed along class lines, spatial justice requires they're not distributed geographically. Several of you have mentioned how life chances, even Lengths of people's lives are dictated by zip codes. That's spatial injustice. And I think what we need to do is keep thinking about social justice, but we need to look at social justice mapped spatially. And we have the most powerful tool that geography has given to the world, which is geographic information systems. We can do this now. You can see spatial injustice, and you can see uh, how spatial justice can be enacted. But I want to give you... I want to bring this down to the street level now. And here's two streets. Uh, one is Massachusetts Avenue in Cambridge, on the right where I live. And on the left is Sodrevegen in Gothenburg, Sweden. Two streets identical, identical width, but the spatial organization of those streets could not be more different. The allocation of rights to space on those streets could not be more different. In the good old US of A, even in Cambridge, Massachusetts, our fair city, for those of you who used to watch Click and Clack the Tappet Twins, or used to listen to them, uh, even in Cambridge, one of the most progressive US cities, what is the principle of rights to space on Massachusetts Avenue? What's the principle? Simple. What's the principle? Yeah, I mean, the, basically, the bigger your vehicle, the more rights you have to public space. That's the American way. On the left, not so much. The Swedes have enacted spatial justice on the street. They have democratized the street. On the left hand side, as you can see, there's a streetcar, there's cycle tracks. There's not just one streetcar, there's another streetcar about 300 yards behind it, and then there's one more this way. To the left of the streetcar is a fence. That 10 or 15% of the street space is the only part of the street space that is given over to private vehicles. And there's no cars on it because everybody's in the, uh, in the, in the um, street cars. 
So what the Swedes have done then is enacted spatial justice. My question though, and, and I throw this open to anybody, how are people, and especially children, growing up on those streets, how are they wired differently? Imagine growing up on the street on the left. What confronts you every single day you walk out your front door? Might is right. How are we going to get across the road, Mama? Cars aren't even stopping when we, stop, when we go to the, uh, the crossing. Kid comes out on the left, and it's a very, very different place. We don't have any longitudinal studies showing the different wirings of kids' brains. I would say maybe American kids are going to be more aggressive. You've got to be more aggressive to get on in that environment. Now, we do have some data. Um, in the early 80s, Don Appleyard and his colleagues in San Francisco looked at social interactions on streets. And on the left was a heavily trafficked street, the middle was a moderately trafficked street, and on the right was a lightly trafficked street. On the lightly trafficked street, you had many more social interactions and cross-street friendships than on the heavily trafficked street. Who do you think lives on heavily trafficked streets more? This is where it fits our work. People on low incomes, minorities. Quiet, calmed streets with high walk scores and high cycle scores are the streets that are most desirable. And I'll come back to that when I talk about complete streets. But you see where I'm going with this? We can even look at the street level in terms of justice and the allocation of rights to public space on the street. Now, one thing I do want you to think about is it's not all doom and gloom. Um, I didn't agree with a lot of things Mayor Bloomberg did, but he appointed Janet Sadiq Khan as his transportation commissioner. They brought in Jan Gale of Copenhagen fame. They energized the already energetic transportation justice sector in New York, and this is the result. We got Times Square changed. This picture is Broadway just outside of Macy's. Would you ever in your life have believed that this was possible in the center of one of the biggest metropolises in the world? My point here, really, really important, urban planning, sustainability, what you're doing should not be about what is probable, but what is possible. We need to be doing things that we think are possible. We're not going to get the, we're not going to get the uh, congestion charge in London if we think, oh, it probably won't be accepted. The High Line didn't happen because, oh, it's probably what's going to happen. People went out on a limb and made things happen. Urban planning has got to be what, about what is possible. If we keep in the probable paradigm, nothing will change. But one of the problems that we have is we're actually pretty damn good at telling uh, people who, that you don't belong in this space. We impose spatial injustice on others through hostile and defensive architecture. Top left, we like stopping kids skateboarding. And actually, I was standing making a phone call, and there's a, a little notice here, no skateboarding, no inline skating, no... Who's been in a park and you see the park notice board and it just says, don't, 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 don't. P.S. Have a good day. <laughs> you know, we've got to find a way of making public spaces available to a wide range of users. So top left, we have the, the studs which stop the skateboarders. Um, in the middle, we have the seat with um, armrests to stop homeless people lying there. We have the extremely violent studs uh, on, the, on the top right. Uh, on the bottom right, we have the rich door, poor doors. Um, many cities, in order to get permits to build uh, large sort of uh, blocks, have to have a certain amount of affordable units. Some designers have been putting the poor door, the poor door around the back, and the rich people go in through the main street. Can you think of anything more insulting that we can do, anything more inhumane than make... This is segregation. This is resegregating our cities. And I'm going to go on more to speak about this because it's creeping up. And in some ways, it's creeping up through what we do. We don't sometimes recognize it, but it is. Most cynically, on the bottom left, <clears throat> anybody know where that is? Deb, you should know where this is. 
It's actually in Seattle. The city of Seattle has a homelessness problem. We get it. So what they did was to stop homeless people <clears throat> sleeping under that bridge, they put bike racks there. Thankfully, the responsible people in the Seattle biking community said, hey, we have a problem with homelessness, but this isn't the way to deal with it. Do not use sustainability infrastructure to deter homelessness. That's not the way to do it. So hostile and defensive architecture, these are ways that we say you don't belong in this space. My friend and colleague at Yale, uh, Elijah Anderson, has, I think, come up with a very elegant idea. He calls it the cosmopolitan canopy. His idea, basically, is that <clears throat> for most of the time, we walk around the streets studiously trying not to catch people's eyes, just keeping ourselves to ourselves and, you know, walking along. But he says there are certain parts of cities, and his classic case is the Reading Terminal Market in uh, Philadelphia, where people let their guard down, where people talk to each other. He describes how he gets into conversations as an urban ethnographer sitting there, conversations about all kinds of things, and that these cosmopolitan canopies are very valuable places in our society. And one question I want to ask is, is there a role for us as urban planners and designers in creating cosmopolitan canopies? Now, I don't want a cosmopolitan canopy checklist. I don't think, I, I don't like checklist planning. It's too easy. People don't ask the right questions. But I do think we can think about this idea of cosmopolitan canopies. Children are a very good feature for building cosmopolitan canopies, especially if there's a water feature. Kids gather around that, parents gather around. Food is a good place. Markets are good places for cosmopolitan canopies. How do we create cosmopolitan canopies? Places of spatial justice where people can walk and in interact freely. Spaces of engagement where people are themselves. One of the other solutions to spatial injustice is complete streets. Now, uh, who couldn't agree with the idea, the concept of a complete street? Um, but again, as a critical urban planner, I want to problematize this idea of complete streets. And I want to ask you the question, can the current complete streets discourse with its design manuals, its policies, and other regulatory structures reverse the inequalities that car-centric planning has exacerbated or created anew? Or will complete streets simply result in enhanced livability only for the most privileged? And here we've got examples from Massachusetts, from Swampscott. We've got the Massachusetts Department of Transport Complete Streets Design Guide, Somerville, Massachusetts, where Tufts University is, uh, Toronto. Um, everywhere has a Complete Streets Design Guide. But my question is, and again, this is the academic in me, can we just design complete streets? Streets are social constructs as well as physical spaces. And Doreen Massey, a geographer, said, places have no fixed meaning, and streets are places. She says, rather, they are constantly shifting articulations of social relations through time. Places are constantly shifting articulations of social relations through time. But yet, most of the physically oriented design manuals dislocate streets from their significant social, structural, symbolic, discursive, and historical realities. My point here is we can't create that street on the left. And incidentally, I was giving this talk in Sheffield, England, and a young woman put her hand up. She said, I used to live on that street. It's in Athens. It's a great street to live on. So that street on the left can't be designed. It happens over time through interaction and discourse, symbolic interactions and discourse. We can do designs, but we need to see social issues as being important on streets, as well as the physicality of the streets. Los Angeles, would you believe the, one of the car metropolises of the United States, has a complete streets policy? And yet it's still, until October last year, banned one of the most vital forms of street life, which was the, uh, the, the, the um, street sellers. Korean, Latino street sellers. 
From tacos or bacon-wrapped hot dogs, these mobile meals create hot spots of social interaction in a city that too often lacks public life. And the question that we ask in the book, in our book, is can streets in a heavily immigrant metropolis, however multimodal the distribution of lane space, be said to be complete if they fail to include the livelihoods and economic survival of vendors, the smells, sights and tastes of homelands and places for people to pause and shop? Now, as it happens, LA has legalised street vending, but for the wrong reason. Not because they want complete streets, they did it because they don't want um, undocumented people causing uh, or, or getting caught up with ICE investigations, so they decided to legalise it. So it's a good reason to do it, but it was not because of the complete streets idea. So a complete street then is a complex of ideas. It's not just a physical design. Um, I'm an editor of a, a series of books. The first book in the series is my own book called Incomplete Streets. And again, I'm not saying complete streets is wrong. I'm saying who gets to define what a complete street is? Because one of the things, points that we make in this book series, and it's a Routledge book series, it's a great series, one of the points we make is that there are important missing narratives in the complete streets movement. And what is now happening is that we are simply systematically reproducing many of the urban, spatial and social inequalities of the past uh, generations that were characterised by, for instance, redlining. So there's now a new concept called greenlining. Redlining was explicitly racist. Greenlining isn't racist, but it's a socio-economic calculus. In the US, to live in walkable, cyclable, traffic-calmed neighbourhoods, you pay the premium. The premium is higher rents and higher house prices. And get this, walkability and cyclability, two of the main metrics of slower neighbourhoods, are uh, owned by the apps for the measuring of walkability and cyclability, walk score and cycle score, are owned by who? Those of you who I told yesterday don't say, but who owns the apps for walk score and cycle score? Redfin, the realtor. We have commoditized sustainability so that realtors now own the apps for walkability and cyclability. That's very, very, very significant. Everybody should have access to walkable, walkable and cyclable neighborhoods, not just those who can afford to pay for it. I could go in, into a lot of depth about urban parks, but again, this book, Rethinking Urban Parks, by my colleague at uh, CUNY, Cephal Lowe, is an excellent book. Um, Rethinking Urban Parks, Public Space and Cultural Diversity. Not Public Space and Biodiversity, Public Space and Cultural Diversity. Her headline is, in this new century, the 21st century, we're facing a different kind of threat to public space. Not one of disuse, but of patterns of design and management design and management that exclude some people and reduce social and cultural diversity. The way we design and manage parks is beginning to have a negative effect on the cultural and social diversity in parks. Now, why is this important? This is important because we're coming apart. We are self-sorting in the US. We have to start as urban planners, uh, as, as, as activists creating spaces of engagement, places where people can meet across difference. I remember when I first moved to Boston 20 years ago, oh yeah, yeah, Boston's pretty diverse. The Asian Americans are over there, the African Americans are over here, the blah, blah, you know, that, that was Boston. And then I went to Oakland and I saw all these people sitting together and I thought, wow, how does Oakland do that? What is it about Oakland that has done that? And, and I'm still trying to work out how do we get groups to be together. And there's, a, there's a, a theory called contact theory. It's not rocket science. And it says that the more interaction you have with difference of any kind, the more likely you are to be more tolerant and more accepting of the need to have policies that increase opportunities to engage uh, across difference. We need to take contact theory seriously. Brexit in Britain happened because of contact theory. If you think about Brexit, it was not an economic vote. It was a vote for xenophobia. It was a vote about immigration. 
and the cities in Britain were solidly behind staying in Europe. It was the small towns outside the big cities, the ones with very few immigrants that voted against staying in Europe. Contact theory works. Big cities, generally, people have a, a, a reasonable experience. Places like Toronto, London, have used diversity and multiculturalism for very creative, to very creative ends. So let's talk about culture difference and diversity then, because, again, this is a very important uh, area, I think, of, of our work. But often we don't talk, we talk about social justice and equity, but culture difference and diversity, culture, cultural competency, these are very important points. And one really excellent book by Phil Wood and Charles Landry says, at what point do cities start to see diversity as less a cost, a drag on scarce resources and a mind-numbing complexity, and start to see it as a force, a resource, and an opportunity? Many cities don't see diversity as a resource. They see it as something to be managed, monitored, uh, not something as a, as a resource that is creative. And so I want to introduce a few concepts, this idea of cities of difference. That's what our cities are, and they are increasingly becoming different. They are places where we're in the, in the presence of otherness, and these are our cities today. And I would argue that my concept of just sustainability helps us recognize, understand, and engage ideas of difference, diversity, and cultural heterogeneity in positive and inclusive ways, but only under two conditions. Number one, we embrace the concept of interculturalism, and second, we take seriously the need for cultural competency. I find too many people in our world who just talk about social justice and equity. I, I know people who are very into social justice and equity, and I've seen them do some incredibly culturally incompetent things. Just being just and equitable does not guarantee cultural competency, and we need, to, we need to recognize that and think about it. Now, one, another excellent book, not mine, but you must read this, The Intercultural City, Planning for Diversity Advantage. This is the book by Phil Wood and Charles Landry. It is readable, and it's, it, will make you, it will make you feel good about what you're doing. But one key point that they, they mention in the book is that the interculturalist approach goes beyond opportunities for respect and celebration of difference to the pluralist transformation of public space, civic culture and institutions. It doesn't recognize cultural boundaries as fixed, but rather as in a state of flux and remaking. And the interculturalist approach aims for dialogue, exchange, reciprocal understanding between different groups and different backgrounds. So I think of somewhere like Boston. You know, it's an intercultural city in many ways. It's, a, it's now a majority minority city. But in no way have the institutions of Boston changed to reflect this reality. In no way. It's still the good old boy network in Boston. Italian, Irish American, the storied institutions of Boston have not changed. Yes, there's a, the mayor's office of New Bostonians, but, you know, that's, that's symbolic. The, the, the core institutions, the power brokers of Boston, are even less diverse according to a Boston Foundation report. So we're not moving towards an interculturalism. We're still at the multicultural phase. And, you know, the big difference, multiculturalism was about celebration. We used to joke in London... Um, as kids at school, it's about steel drums, saris, and samosas. You know, you play on some steel drums, you get dressed up in a sari, and you eat samosas, and that's it. And then you go home, and you can be a nasty little racist, but you've done your multicultural bit. Interculturalism is about changing the institutions alongside the change of the, the nature of the population. Why is this important? Well, there's a great report, and I can, again, I will provide the slides here, and I will also um, provide any of the reports that I mentioned. Great report called Immigrant Engagement in Public Open Space. And the point that they're making this paper is we have parks by Olmsted. We have great uh, institutions and great places in Boston, 
and the organisations that manage these places are friends of organisations, friends of the park, friends of uh, Boston Common, etc. These organisations are resolutely white and everybody loves these spaces, but the new Bostonians that might decide the future of some of these spaces are not part of the management of these spaces. We have this disconnect here. So as, as it says, Olmsted's vision continues to resonate with a great many Bostonians, but it may not resonate with the majority of those who will decide Boston's future. How do we get more people involved in friends of organisations who don't look like the typical uh, people who are in the, those organisations? So the question I ask then is, how do we adopt an interculturalist approach to engage across difference? And I want to look at two or three ideas. Number one, an idea for engagement and belonging that I call landscape links. A lot of uh, Latinos in Boston gravitate to certain landscapes that remind them of where they're from. And a Guatemalan American in Alston, Brighton said, families gravitate towards Herta Park because for many the landscape reminds them of home. Extended family gatherings on uh, riverbanks are popular in Central America and the trees along the shore remind many immigrants of the all day Sunday uh, picnics they enjoyed in El Salvador or Guatemala. And a commentator talks about the willows and how the willows reminded her of, of home. So one way of engagement, of increasing belonging, is to look at this idea of landscape links. How can we make links between landscapes now and people's landscapes of childhood? Another way of engaging belonging is through food justice. But we're not doing a very good job in many ways, and I talked a little bit about this yesterday in, in the group that I was in. I got a problem with the concept of local. I don't have the time to go through it fully, but w I want to ask you the question, what is local food in an intercultural society? This is George and Julia Bowling, uh, formerly tobacco uh, farmers in Maryland. Now, with grants from the state of Maryland, and because they're good entrepreneurs, that's the signboard to their farm. They now sell and grow African produce because they've seen that there's 150,000 Africans, diplomats, doctors, in fact, there's more Ghanaian doctors in Maryland than there are in Ghana. So, you know, you, you get the point. There's a lot of middle and upper middle class Africans in DC and they want to eat African food grown locally. So what is local food in an intercultural society? Is it what the predominantly ecologically minded alternative food movement says is local? Or is it culturally local? What these different cultures perceive as local? The Filipinos in San Diego, when asked what's local food, they say our food is local food. What we eat in our restaurants, what we grow in our yards. And so uh, one particular academic has talked about the translocal identity, that we shouldn't just talk about local now, translocalism is an important concept. And again, words matter. If we want a larger food movement, we have to think about some of the words we use. Local can be very exclusive. How do we make local inclusive? I love this particular slide, um, and this is from a book of mine on, on food justice. Um, this is from the former South Central Farms in LA. The farm is now no longer there, but they, the, the authors of the chapter interviewed a 30-year-old Zapotec woman who talked about her, herself and belonging in this way. She said, I planted this garden because it's a little space like home. I grow the same plants that I had back in my garden in Oaxaca. We can eat like we ate at home, and this makes us feel like ourselves. It allows us to keep a part of ourselves after coming to the United States, allows us to keep who we are after coming to the United States. Food is the umbilical link between where you're from and where you are now. Food is the umbilical, that's a tweet tweetable moment, folks. Get on, come on, come on, come on. Um, <laughs> food is the umbilical link between where you're from and where you are now. And most people, most immigrants recognize that. Food is increasingly important for immigrants in these, these trying times. So 
not just cre uh, creating uh, you know, culturally appropriate foods, but creating gardens that are spatially organized, like the gardens you used to have. It's important for people to do that. Another factor of engagement, can we design in encounter? Can we create spaces where we design in encounter? And um, this is Super Keelan Park in Norrebrough in Copenhagen. For all of those of you who think that uh, the Nordic countries are just full of tall blonde people, they're not. Um, Copenhagen, Oslo, Stockholm, Helsinki, I've been to them all, increasingly diverse cities as these liberal democracies uh, accept uh, a large number of immigrants. And so Norrebrough is a very uh, heavily immigrant section of uh, Copenhagen, and there's a linear park. There's a cycle path goes right through it. And what they decided to do here, what the designers decided to do was to find out from local people what they wanted to see in the park. And so what they said was, we want artifacts from our own countries. We want artifacts from our own countries to help feel presence, belonging. You see how important this concept of belonging is? It really, really, really is important. Now, you know, some people, and I've presented this in Copenhagen, some people have said, ah, you know, well, Julian, it, it didn't really work. No, I, I disagree. This is a first step. This is not the end game. The first step is to get parks that mean something to people. Now, there may have been restrictions on funding or something like that, but I am sure that, uh, and I've been there on, on warm days and watched people and kids talking and parents playing. This is good. This is what we need, spaces that are meaningful to people, spaces of contact, spaces of engagement. Another thing we need is deep ethnographies. Forget the design charrettes where you've already decided what you want to do and you get a few people to agree with you. Let's go for deep ethnography. And there is a group of people at the University of Sheffield in, in England uh, called the Transnational, uh, Transnational Urban Outdoor Research Group who research specifically on how different groups use public spaces. Now, let me ask you a question. Has anybody read the paper, Ethnographic Understandings of Ethnically Diverse Neighbourhoods to Inform Urban Design Practice? You have. I love you. I'm going <laughs> to... Give me your address. I'm going to send you a copy of my book. No, I, I, I... Seriously, I ask this. I'm the editor of the journal, actually. This paper is... I mean, it's a great paper. It's got, in a very, very easy, accessible way, all the things that we're talking about now. How do you do these things in urban parks. The, they started this, uh, this hashtag, Refugees Welcome in Parks, a resource book. You can go and download it. They've got a great project called Benches for Everyone. Benches are very significant. Benches are very significant. But in, in the US, often, we divide up the benches to stop homeless people sleep. How do we create uh, you know, solitude in public, uh, sociability for free? How do we create that uh, in our towns and cities. So deep ethnography, the use of anthropological approaches to public space so that we can begin to understand how people use space rather than telling them through a design charrette, this is what's going to happen. I just want to go really quickly through this. Cultural competency. I think cultural competency is essential for planning in the future, planning in urban design. Yet my students have done some research and we found that no one of the accredited, 84 accredited planning programs in the US, none of them has cultural competency as a core curriculum class. Can you believe that? Urban planners are the people going out to help people define the communities of the future, and yet we're not taking cultural competency seriously. Cultural competency is the range of awareness, beliefs, knowledge, skills, behaviours and professional practice that will assist in planning and policy making in, for and with multiple publics. And if we want this intercultural city, if we want a city of engagement and difference and a city that works, we have to plan for it. We can't leave it to chance. Two professions, though. Healthcare and social work, two urban professions, do take it seriously. 
they do take it seriously. And I want to just really give a shout out to the healthcare profession. Quote, given the strong evidence for socio-cultural barriers to care at multiple levels of the healthcare system, culturally competent care is a key cornerstone in efforts to eliminate racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare. What would more culturally competent planning and policy making help to do? Would it help eliminate racial, ethnic and cultural disparities in what and how we plan and make policy? Let's think about that. I think it would. So, in conclusion then, the idea I want to put here is culturally inclusive practice. If we're going to truly manage our co coexistence in shared space, we need more diverse set of planning professionals who look like the communities we're working in. This is a really, really important point. If your organisation doesn't look like the community it's working in, is it legitimate? Does it have traction? Is it credible? One organisation that I will hold up from Boston is Dudley Street Neighbourhood Initiative. Before they formed in the 1980s, they did a community survey, a demographic survey, and they constituted the board of directors and the staff to look like the community. And this is an organization that has been going for 30 years. It's the only US nonprofit that was ever given uh, eminent domain powers. They've done an amazing job on, um, with community land trusts, with affordable housing, etc., etc. So really what we need to do is look at culturally inclusivity in our profession. We do a pretty good job here at, at Eco Districts and with the Eco Districts movement, but you can go to some conferences and really they are not diverse. It's not reflective of the US today. Now, I, I'm realizing time is, is, is moving on and I, uh, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna drop, I won't do the sharing cities piece, I don't think, because it's just, it's, it's probably another 15 minutes and I think you're gonna be, activating the trapdoor, so I'll probably drop, <laughs> drop down through there, won't I? Won't I? So listen, I, I'm actually going to leave it there. Um, thanks very much, and I'm more than happy to uh, answer questions uh, now or via email uh, in, in the future. But if anybody also wants a copy of the, um, uh, the, the, the notes here, I'm sure uh, Briante will send them out. Thank you. All right, does anybody have any questions for Julian? Um, Richard Avila, so yes, there is no cultural competency in urban planning, so the solution is to become a social worker and an urban planner at the University of Southern California. Um, so I'm really interested in the relationship you talked about, belonging and becoming. Belonging and becoming seems like a relationship between, that is very particular to the queer ethical subject. The idea of disorder and order, the idea of self-determination and realization. Do you think, well, two questions, so it sounds to me like what we need is queer urbanism, um, and second, because in social work, the, the thing that, that we happens in social work is yes, we have the cultural competency, but we still live under the stigma of Jane Addams, that our role is only to rehabilitate people into a system, whereas what we need to be doing is radicalizing and revolutionizing the status quo. So we get caught up in the stigmas of, of being only in social welfare, of only taking away children. So then it becomes kind of hard to have the conversation across in urban planning. Do you think there's such a thing as clinical planning, taking the, the exact sort of treatment that we use um, in individuals and when we do therapy and applying that to the city as the client? Um, so multiple things there. I mean, there is a, a growing literature on queer urbanism. Um, there's uh, several professors that I know of who are leading in, in that sort of area. And again, if, you, if you're interested, I can uh, send you some, some, some papers on that. Um, and in, in my book, I do address those issues. And in fact, I was teaching, a, I was on sabbatical at McGill University in Montreal uh, last year, and a young student came up to me and said, um, your book is the first book. He said, I always look through any planning book that I'm taking a course of, and your book is the first that mentions, you know, queer and LGBTQ issues. So there is, yes, there is a literature on that. Uh, therapeutic planning, again, there is a literature on therapeutic planning, borrowing a lot of ideas from social work. And let's, let's not forget that social work and urban planning were together in the settlement movement of Jane Addams and, um, and, and that group of people. And then the men took planning off into, you know, the land use planners, the, the technical planners went off 
uh, and it was largely male, and sort of social planning kind of ended until sort of equity planning came back in the 50s and 60s, Norm Crumholtz in, um, in, in, in Cleveland, places like that. So, yeah, are, are you doing a degree, a, a joint degree in uh, social work and urban planning? Ah, that's great, that's great. There was one other question over there, yeah. So I would say, um, actually, you want to do your degree in social work and uh, urban planning at the University of Michigan, where you would have a macro course, in which case you wouldn't have that question. Um, my, my question is, uh, <laughs> so I came to urban planning and social work through anthropology. And so I've been really um, intellectually interested, but uh, as a practitioner, very challenged by the uh, kind of evolving discussion around cultural misappropriation or cultural appropriation. And, um, and you know, that, as it's getting used in the, in the contemporary meaning, is different than how it was used um, at the time that I was in undergrad. And <clears throat> it's a little confusing to me in relationship to understanding cultural diffusion and also in, in relation to your slides, talking about how it's really essential to inclusion and the feeling of belonging to have these artifacts that are embedded into our physical landscape, into our social landscape, and having lived in places like Tucson where the ubiquity of the interculturalism is really you know, deep, um, I, I'm, uh, I don't know what to do with people who feel that um, artifacts of their culture are diminishing and taking away as opposed to celebrating and including and I'm just wondering what your experience is. Well, it's so, so interesting. Um, I mean, the first thing you talked about was about cultural appropriation. You know, w what is the uber narrative of urban planning at the moment? It's placemaking. That makes the assumption that there was no place there before. I mean, I'm, my next paper is actually going to be called Place Taking or Placemaking. We're actually taking place, aren't we? If what I said at the beginning was true, that this land was not ours in the first place. And, and yet, if you look at the... Uh, my students don't get bored with this, but they, they, uh, all the time I'm looking at the significance of words. Redevelopment, blight, all of these loaded terms to say that where you lived actually was not good. I don't think your place is good. I mean, you know, Jane Jacobs set us straight on a lot of these things, but the very words, placemaking, assume that there was no place there, or that the place that we're making now is better in some ways. But what we're doing is place-taking. We're taking places away from those people who had place already. So let's, let's just be very, very clear about that. And um, in getting so emotional about this, I've forgotten the rest of your question. Um, but, but cultural appropriation is, I mean, it, it, it's, it's all around, isn't it? Um, you know, gentrification is cultural appropriation. I mean, people want neighborhoods that are authentic, which means a little bit ethnic, really. That's what, that's what it means. <laughs> a little bit ethnic, not too ethnic, but just a little bit ethnic. Um, and, but if the neighborhood trips over into too much ethnic, then that's a problem. So, so uh, we appropriate in everything we do in urban planning. That's what we do. Now, are we okay with that? Well, I, I think if we understood that we did that, then maybe we would think of a different way of doing placemaking, or maybe call it something different than, than placemaking, which is neo-colonial, isn't it? Placemaking. Your place wasn't good enough. Let's do it differently. So I would say yes and. Yeah. I mean, you even cited the article, right? That, that article about how we have multiple publics. Yes. And so, really, the placemaking, and as I understand the meaning, is about negotiating the dynamic space, right? And so, for me, I don't, I mean, I just am interpreting it differently. We, yeah. we might agree on the premise, but not necessarily on how we're making meaning on those words. Um, and so, yeah, I just feel like that that negotiated space is the, the tension of what we're all doing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, look, I mean, this is where this concept of recognition and reconciliation comes in and why it's so important. We need to recognize that we are doing this. It's not to say let's stop doing it, but let's recognize that some of the language that we use in urban planning is, is very settler colonial. It's neo-colonial language, but yet we do it in the name of sustainability, so it's okay. 
I'm obviously a little scared to ask a question now, Julian. <laughs> Why, just because you're a New Zealander? No, uh, you shouldn't. You, that's any, that's any all right. Any words I use are bound to be dismantled, but let's see. Um, so, what, what, I mean, I think from the, the spatial justice, really helpful thinking, and I guess what I take from that is, you know, district scale work is excellent, but it has to be a means to a bigger ends, and you have to sort of tackle, if we're not using it to transform cities in a, in a way the community wants, then you'll basically create spatial injustice. But I just think in terms of also the, the diversity and so how to find ways that the agents of change in the community represent and look like the community, what, in sort of practical terms, how is that maybe playing out at a governance level and, and both for neighborhood scale and city scale? Um, an idea of sort of some citizen assembly models that seem to be gaining some traction in, in Europe, I think, have quite a lot of potential if done well. But uh, what are you seeing in North America that's maybe sort of leading practices and, and sort of taking those ideas into, into decision making? Well, you know, what's interesting, actually, this is where actually North America, well, the United States particularly, has actually been quite good in many ways because of the environmental justice movement. I mean, EJ groups, many of the EJ groups, certainly the community ones, not the, like the Sierra Club who get all the big grants for environmental justice projects, uh, but I'm talking about the small community focused groups, have really started to show us the importance of, of diversity in working for environmental and sustainability ends. So there are some great models out there. And as I mentioned, organizations in Boston like the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative or ACE, Alternatives for Community and Environment, have really come up from communities. I think the problem often happens when um, organizations go into communities rather than coming up from, and, and we've got a great example. So. ACE and Dudley Street Neighbourhood Initiative are two organisations that have come up from the community. And then there's a, another organisation that gets a lot of funding called The Food Project. Many of you might have heard of it. Well, they were based in Gloucester, Massachusetts, and they came into Boston, and they're having a harder time getting traction. Now, they get lots of funding because, you know, um, they do pretty good work with disadvantaged youth. But they are, they're not of the community, they are they've moved into the community and that presents a whole range of factors credibility and, and and other factors so I think you know if we have ground up organizations they're much more likely to have um, traction credibility legitimacy um, in 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 communities yeah thank you, thank you so much Julian thank you so much